going slightly back, I was told that I had sort of low mood, anxiety, and stuff like that. Um, but it was it was manageable to the point of where having the discussion and going out for the walks would maintain it. It wasn't I needed to go on medication or anything yet, you know. But if I if I probably went to my GP with with that sort of stuff straight away, yeah, take these straight away rather than looking at these alternative things to sort it out, you know, which can definitely end down a bit more of a slippery uh, route. So the group originally came about because I wanted to help and support that because what I went through in that process was nothing short of traumatic. They are forgotten people and they're the classic suffering silence lads, mate. Because I've seen them go in there in their best suits with all their files in place, ready to go because they're looking for the greatest. Uh, that I'm going to win this today, I'm going to see my kids. And then I see them come out the other side at the end of it and it's nothing but emotion just drawn from their face. And you hear the conversations when they're coming out of the courtrooms, like, oh, well done, we won and all this. They don't think about a lad's life that they've destroyed. Yeah. You have the other half coming in with their free solicitors and like, entourage and all this sort of malarkey, you know, paid for by the government. Every single floor, you go in, you know yourself, you go in, you look at the listings, and there'd be, I, I used to go to the Central Family Court in Holborn, and there used to be, I think there's about five floors, 10 courts on each floor, and it would be Ramo from the moment it opens till five o'clock. Now, if, there's, if, there, if you're telling me there's a problem, that's what it is. But there's always yeah. that worry. What if nobody comes and they're going to look ridiculous? Yeah. Did you ever get a sense of that when you invite the other people? Did you ever feel really worried that actually nobody is going to join you? <laughs> Hi, my name's Andrew Payne and welcome to Men On Show and I am delighted to have as our guest today Scott Johnson on the show. Scott founded the Proper Blokes Club with the simplest of actions in that he started going for some walks. He took videos of himself walking in his favourite spots, talking about some of the mental health challenges he faced and he simply asked if anyone else was struggling and would they like to join him. And fast forward to today, he has a small army of walking men sharing their stories, seeking support and fellowship with groups all over London. Scott, you're a complete inspiration. Uh, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. You're welcome. So, Scott, just to get us started, uh, tell me about your life growing up. What was life like? Um, yeah, very yeah, just a working class background, really. I was um, I was brought up by my nan, mum and aunt um, in a place called Bermondsey in Southwark. Uh, in London, um, and I, I've been around that way all my life, really. And I was, and I was never um, growing up wanting stuff, you know. Like I was uh, very well looked after, being the only man in the uh, in the household, you know. So, uh, so I was really lucky in that sense. I had really good support around me. Because cool. I mean, I was looking at the Proper Blokes website. We'll obviously talk more about the Proper Blokes in a moment. Uh, <laughs> and I love your story, but you, you said uh, on, on your website you, you'd had some of your own mental health challenges. Uh, do you mind sharing what some of those challenges have been for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, so so all my so before what was it? it? Must have been sort of 24, 25, I was very uh very much a stereotypical bloke, you know, like I bottled up a lot of stuff and uh never spoke about it because it wasn't spoke about in your friendship groups or the pubs you went down or anything like that. It was it was seen as a weakness then, you know. But um but it wasn't until I had my own children and I went and I was in and out of the court system for what the best part of 10 years trying to get access and stuff like that, which um, at the early stages was still really difficult, but I was still with that mindset of, no, I tuck everything away and, 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 and just put out the back of my mind and everything will be all right. And then I'm a man, I don't, I don't show these type of emotions and stuff like that. But, um, but it just got too much. I, I was, I was going to work and things like that. I was there physically, but mentally, spiritually, whatever you want to think about it, um, I wasn't there at all. You know, like I was in a completely different space, and uh, and I said, and I just, I just said, I couldn't live like this anymore. You know, and uh, and I was, I always say, I'm one of the lucky ones because I actually reached out and got um, some amazing support from the NHS. Uh, had some CBT therapy with those guys and counselling. The only issue was, was it a very limited amount of time? You know. Um, I was only doing eight sessions and then it's and then it's back into back into the wild as it is, you know, and uh 
and they uh, referred me on to my local counsellor, which at my GP, but I didn't have that relationship with that person. So I couldn't, so I didn't continue with it. So I was, I was, I was searching for my own uh, methods and things to help me maintain that feeling on a daily basis after I had my CBT sessions, which was once a week. Um, and exercise was one of the biggest things that kept coming up, you know, like the massive link between exercise and mental health, your physical and mental health come hand in hand, you know, and it wasn't until when I'd done a bit of research until you actually make that connection. Yeah, that does make, well, I never feel rubbish after going for a run or playing sports or whatever, you know, um, but I wasn't, I wasn't much of a gym go or anything like that. So walking was my exercise of choice, you know, and, and from there I made, I made it a case of going out on a daily basis, going out for even a 15, 20 minute walk minimum, you know, a day just to get myself level headed and, uh, just that, just being out in the open as well, you know, um, r- really helps. But go, going slightly back, I was told that I had sort of, sort of low mood, anxiety, and, and stuff like that. Um, but it was it was manageable to the point of where having the discussions and going out for the walks would maintain it. It wasn't I needed to go on medication or anything yet, you know. But if I if I probably went to my GP with with that sort of stuff straight away yeah take these straight away rather than looking at these alternative things to sort it out you know which can definitely end down a bit more of a slippery uh, route yeah i mean there's so much in what you've just said obviously you did reach out to the nhs you were one of the lucky ones there was some support available to you although not probably the complete amount that you needed interesting about the family courts i mean i think there's a, a lot of dads that that can really resonate with what you've said, I myself have been uh, in the family courts for, for many years uh, mm. in, in a previous life. And I, I found, I don't know about you, but the family courts, you, the stakes couldn't be higher because it's mm. your access to your children. When you're in the courts, you've got all these sort of uh, barristers racing around. It feels so intimidating yeah, and it's so unpredictable. It's mm-hmm. just so, did you find that? That that was mainly one of the reasons why I set up. So the group originally came about because I wanted to help and support dads. Because what I what I went through in that process was nothing short of traumatic, you know. Because I didn't want to bring anybody else with me to court days because I didn't want to uh, bring them into that environment. And then usually you have the other half coming in with their free solicitors and like entourage and all this sort of malarkey, you know, paid for by the government, and. um and every single floor, you go in, you know yourself, you go in, you look at the listings and there'd be, I, I used to go to the Central Family Court in Holborn and there used to be, I think there's about five floors, 10 courts on each floor and it would be Ramo from the moment it opens till five o'clock. Now, if, there's, if, there, if you're telling me there's a problem, that's what it is. And then you're seeing all these barristers running around and all of that and after, and you hear the conversations when they're coming out of the courtrooms, I've like, oh, all done, we won and all this. They don't think about a lad's life that they've destroyed. You know, because they've won their case and it's a little tick box to um whatever that whatever they've done um and stuff, you know. And I held a lot of um animosity towards everything in the court system. The judges, Kafkas, um maybe social services for some people if it was involved, uh, solicitors and everyone, because I thought everybody's against dads in this scenario. But looking back at it in hindsight, I would I sympathize with the judges because you've got two people, two complete different stories, no evidence back in it. Who do you go with? You know, I, I, I couldn't imagine being in that scenario. To lizards, I would never, ever recommend going to those guys. Just teach yourself the basics and you're going to get the same if you spend a pound or 50 grand. That's the, that, that's, that's my take on that anyway. But uh, but yeah, no, going forward as well, we, I definitely want to do more with lads, you know, in the court system because they are the unforgotten people and they're the classic suffering silence lads, mate. Because I've seen them go in there in their best suits, with all their files in place, ready to go because they're looking for the greatest. Uh, cause I'm going to win this today. I'm going to see my kids. And then I see them come out the other side at the end of it and it's nothing but emotion just drawn from their face, you know? I but think yeah, the that's... way, I mean, you're right, the way that I sort of coped, and I agree with you with some of the sort of the bitter feelings, is that, yeah, the, the, the courts don't get a lot of time with each individual case, each case of which is highly complex. And so it's not surprising mm-hmm. that, that actually good, uh, decent parents get get a rough deal, mums and dads in the family court. Yeah, yeah. But but moving on, you, so you started walking uh, and filming yourself uh, on the mm. walks in your favourite places. Um, did you ever think 
in those early days that that action and the inviting other guys to join you did you ever think it would grow into the emerging movement that it is today no definitely not it was um it's very much the case of like if i go back to the beginning it was i wanted to start up a little group round in Southwark, try and get a few lads that might end up being me mates you know and then uh cutting the group down and then um and then and then just and then just cutting the group off and then just cracking on with whatever sort of dead end job I would have probably ended up in and and just going from there. So I'm really um I'm really grateful that I've sort of changed my mindset in the sense that I want the old Scott because the old Scott would have very much just done that because that was a lazy option, you know. But um but yeah, carrying on and and where it's gone now is uh, unimaginable, you know. Yeah. And did you ever feel so as this thing starts to grow or you start inviting other people? Because my thing is, you know, it's a little bit like at Christmas. We invite the neighbours round. We reach out to people that we don't know on our road. But there's always that worry. What if nobody comes and then we're going to look ridiculous? Did you ever get a sense of that when you're inviting other people? Did you ever feel really worried that actually nobody was going to join you? On that first ever walk in Southwark? I, I, I was so pumped up by the feedback that I had on social media and everything like that. I honestly had it in my head that there was going to be thousands of lads down at that meeting point because <laughs> now I'm going and all the lads are going to start opening up and like I'm really reaching a lot of people. Got down there, nobody was there. So it was the opposite, you know. And um, and it was only because I waited 10 minutes that the first lad, obviously Jack, who was, um, and I always thank him so much for coming because none of this would have happened. That all I could see is him, just, I can visualise it now. He's running towards me and he says, oh, Scott, sorry, I'm late. Is this the walking group? I was like, all right, yeah, because in my head, I thought there's going to be hundreds of people done. So I've only got one lad to chat to. And I was a little bit antisocial before I started this. So it's a bit weird how I started a, a talking group of loads of people. Then we, we was out for about five hours that night, just chatting away. Like we'd done the original route and uh, and it was something we both needed. And, and he's an incredible inspiration, Jack, and he's got a great story. But um, but yeah, we just bounced off each other that whole night and it just flew past really quickly, you know. And then we posted up the first ever picture of the group, which was just me and him. And then, um, and then it just went from there, mate. And since then, since obviously Jack joined you, somebody showed up, which is really cool, and you, you've grown from that. Mm. Have there been any days recently where it's felt like actually you're really struggling as a group, or has it been pretty much plain sailing since then? Um, the, the, the group has really grown organically. Like we're on our, it was our third sort of birthday, I guess, if you want to call it um, anniversary, whatever, last a couple of weeks, kind of 15th of September what I've realised is it's grown very organically and it's the first thing I've ever done where I've not pushed. I've just let it flow and I've come to the ideas and I've, and I've put them into place, but I've just let, I've just relaxed a lot more with it. But what I've realised over the past year since we've become an official CIC, um, obviously because the workload was so much then, it's, it's got a lot bigger from just one group and a couple of lads. Um, the pressure of all the other stuff running a running a business or an organization is sort of like that's a bit more um intimidating. You know, I'm loving every bit of it because I'm learning every day, you know, like you've got to put on your marketing hat one day or your finance hat another and then your sales presence hat another day, you know. But um but I do because I know everything that I do with that, although it might not be my specialty, it's going towards something for the greater good, you know, like it's going towards building this organization into something that's going to be massive, you know, and like I always describe it as it's like a steam train going down an hill with no brakes on. You're not stopping it. You know, like it's just going, <laughs> you know. And um, yeah, so, so that's where we are at the moment. But I do get overwhelmed a little bit sometimes, but I've got some really great lads. Um, you've got your Johns, you've got your James, you've got your Dans and all that behind the scenes that are that are people that I can talk to, you know. So I say to them, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this, going to do this, going to do this. And they say, Scott, right, yeah, all great ideas but let's do this one first. Like they put in order for me a little bit better because my mind goes 100 mile an hour and I want to do everything. Like I have an idea Monday. I want to implement it Tuesday. If it ain't successful on a Wednesday, I've got the ump by Thursday, you know? So, <laughs> and then I give up on a Friday. But lucky enough, like I've got really good lads around me that I've sort of talked to these uh, people beforehand. And I've got an amazing partner, Sophie, who, um, who I bounce stuff off and she does exactly the same thing, you know, like super supportive of what we're doing. But, um, helps me organise my brain a little bit, you know, and I think it's so important having these people behind you because although, yeah, I might be the front of everything, but behind me, the team is 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 what makes us go forward, you know? Yeah, no, that's amazing. And just out of interest, I, I love the name for your group, i got to mm-hmm. say. You could have called it just Scott's 
man group or whatever. Yeah. The proper <laughs> blokes club. I like that. Yeah. Where did that name come from? How big headed would it be if I called it Scott's Walking Club? Uh, terrible would that be? Uh, and I'd probably get I'd probably get um told off as I that in the group. Uh, so yeah, you probably would have thought of doing that. Uh, no, the, the the name it was. To be fair, I was playing about a different names. One part was a gentleman's club, and I thought, nah, that can't be. Like I, I second thought that one. I thought, no, nah, we can't call it that. Uh, so, uh, so the proper blokes club because bloke is something that I hear a lot you know being um, South East London it's a word that gets banded about a lot and it's probably it's probably latched on to some people in the wrong way but all the blokes that I know the proper blokes you know they're they're really good sort of the earth type of people and even if people look at the dictionary it just says an Australian term a good bloke so I think that's a nice one but um, it was just a play with words really and it was a conversation starter which is which is one of the big things, you know. Even like down to the logo and things like that. Although they're pretty simple, they're a bit of fun, but they're good conversation starters. But there's nothing really deep behind it, you know. So interesting. And so uh, for the proper blokes club, just mm-hmm. tell me briefly what's your vision? What are some of your ideas for where you want that group to go in the next sort of twelve months or so? Um, well, so, 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 so the idea is obviously. The, the vision now over the next two years by 2025 is to have a walk in every London borough, um, which is 32. And I think we're in nine London boroughs now. Um, so over the next two years, there's going to be a lot more pushing going forward, you know, but you might be able to get a walk that covers two boroughs, you know, like you could be on the back on the borough boat. Um, but I just want it, I just want it to be a case of when I get a message from a lad in need who needs that support that there is one within five miles where they live, you know, in London. Because one of the big things we have is people contact us, oh, we've got to walk here. Sorry, we ain't got to walk there, but we've got it here. And it's, oh, no, it's too far away from it, Scott. You know, I want to eliminate that excuse too far, you know. Because if you really, really need, I have a lad coming from miles to come to some of these walks because they really need it, they value it, and they come down. But I can't expect everyone to just value it that much, you know. Especially if you're you're in a bad place, the last thing you want to do is get on a train for half an hour to come to something, you know. So you want something there, walk in maybe ten minutes on a tube or something like that. So, so that's the vision going forward over the next two years. But then if we're going five to ten years uh, uh, long, we we, we want to be uh, national. Ideally, have something in every major London city um, to to push forward. Because obviously, the bigger we get, the more funding we get, then we can get more people on board on paid roles who can organise um, different parts and categorise the, um, uh, the UK and get people running them in certain areas. But this can work everywhere and it will. It, it just It's just a matter of, of time. Amazing. That's just truly, yeah. truly amazing. I love the sound of your vision. I love the reason why you have that vision. That's truly mm. amazing. And while, while I've got you, Scott, um, I'm interested, you know, we hear so much that men don't talk how do we get our men to talk and, and my view is i don't know about you i'll ask you but is that men probably do talk uh, as long as mm. the conditions are right well what's yeah. your view do, do men not naturally talk what, what do you think about uh, um that? i think i think well, i think the problem is half of it's generational you know so their dads didn't talk their dads didn't talk their dads didn't talk so it just goes down the line you know and you even see it now i work with young people and stuff like that and you can see some of the lads they find it really difficult um, to talk about stuff that really matters, you know, and and if you ask them why, then they probably on their own anyway. They probably say, "Well, that's how I've been brought up," you know. So that's probably the biggest factor. But the biggest thing to help us combat that, funny enough, is women, because the biggest supporter of us has been women: the wives, the mums, the sisters, the girlfriends, whatever, the nans, the aunts, they're all the all the best friends. We the majority of people that contact us through social media to ask what we're doing are females because they see it directly because lads are we're very much you know like we don't see our own problems you know what I mean if we were to do a 24 hour recording of how we look sometimes we come home from work or anything like that just look as miserable as anything you know oh, I don't want to talk oh, I don't you know what I mean but we can't see that they see it all the time you know so they're our biggest um our biggest refer and our, and our biggest help, you know. But then once we get them in, our job now is to create that environment to keep them, you know, because if they go from their normal laddie culture where they can't talk about things anyway into ours and it's the same, then you're going to lose them, you know. So the first part is getting them to the walk, which is obviously the women usually help us. Some lads reach out, you know, 
And then once they're on, create that culture, create that atmosphere where it's safe, where they, they can talk if they want to. But we also have that where it's not too serious. It's really informal, really, really relaxed, you know. That's really, really interesting and insightful. Um, women, that the, the actually uh, a way forward with men's mental health is is drawing in women to to be mm-hmm. our allies. Um I really think that's a hugely important point. Really interesting that so many of your referrals are mm. are women. That's really, really interesting. And I mean, I guess with that, do, do you see, you know, we hear a lot about toxic masculinity, you know, particularly in the press and the media. Do, do you think men and boys are struggling today? Do you think masculinity is inherently toxic? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think masculinity is good, you know. Like, p- people need to be able to be a man if they want to be a man, you know, or an old school an old school man out there for trade, you know. But I, but I think when you come to the toxic side, that's when we're looking at, um, especially the younger generation, now, they're very influenced by people on social media, which is an absolute nightmare. And these, these people are terrible, terrible, terrible role models for these young people. And they're so easily influenced. It's just easy. They could watch one video of a man talking down to a woman, be rude at work, earn loads of money, have this lifestyle, which is all absolute rubbish, you know, and we all know that, you know, but they, they look at it because I, I work with young people between 18 and 16. These are the, these are the catchment for these lads. And you talk to them like they, they, they are working football, right? So their life is, I want to be a football player. None of them, none of them want to work hard enough to become it. They want the lifestyle because that's how it's portrayed. And that is, and that's a part of that toxic masculinity, you know? There's nothing wrong with being a hard-working man that wants to provide for his family. And they, and they go by those traditional values. No problem whatsoever. But when you start adding all that other stuff on there that they're, that they're showing to young people, not even just young people, you know, because I've been caught with that. I'm 36, you know? And I sometimes look at some of these social media posts, I think, guys, oh, mate, they're doing all right, aren't they? You know, like, what mind that for five minutes on his yacht, you know what I mean? But, you know, as soon as he turns that phone off, you know what I mean? He has to hand that yacht back over, he's rented for the day, you know what I mean? Whatever it is, you know? And he just come back to reality. And I think you just need to... I really encourage these lads, especially, and all like that, just to be individual and just stop caring about, one, what other people think of you and just live your life, you know? Live your life how you want to live it. As long as you're contributing to society in a good way, you know, I'm all for it. No, that's amazing. Uh, a really, again, really insightful stuff. Um, mm. So, how, how do um, how do people get in touch with you, Scott? For for anyone wanting to join proper mm. uh, proper Oaks club, anyone that just wants to find out more about yeah. what you're doing, it's so important what you're doing. Mm. What's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, I'll, I'll always say that the best way is to just use your search engine on your phone or Google, wherever it may be. Just type in the proper Oaks club. It literally lists from our website down to all our social media pages. Any publications, any podcasts will be in it, will be on that search engine. And, and it just gives you not not only the locations of where we walk and stuff like that and how to get in contact, but it might give you a bit more insight to how we do things and all that. And obviously give people the opportunity to listen to podcasts like this one, you know, which will be on there as well at some point. Um, just, just about what we do and what type of people we are, you know, like, because I think some people can get a little bit, Right, or is there a hidden agenda in this? You know, do, do, do we have to go into, like, do we all meet in a big circle and everyone looks at us and a really intimidating environment and you have to talk about your emotions and feelings, like, why are you here? So tell me. And it ain't like that at all, you know. Um, but yeah, go on, go on to ty- type us into um, any of your search engines and that's the best way to find out where your walks are and everything we do. Sure, perfect. And just to conclude, Scott, I mean, I so appreciate your time on the podcast today. Um, if you had a final sort of brief message for to encourage men and boys, what would that be? Uh, if you ever feel like you need to talk to somebody about whatever issue it may be, there's people out there. You're never, ever, ever alone, no matter how much you feel that. There's so many great professional organisations out there that are free, that can help you at the drop of a hat. And... And even if you want to come down to us and talk, you know, like we're free and you can come, you can, you can say it half an hour before the walk, you know, and come down to us. So, yeah, you're, you're, you're never alone. And, and if you feel you need to talk, make sure you talk. Brilliant. Look, Scott, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the I show. I appreciate it. Thank you.